on this episode of The End of Tourism. So it's an incredibly exploitative thing because basically the pull, the attraction, the things that tourists are still told that they're supposed to be seeing are free goods to the industry. The industry did not have to paint the Mona Lisa. And the industry wouldn't have to paint another Mona Lisa to double the numbers of people they could dump into the Louvre. All they have to do is double the size of their tour bus or double the number of tour buses that arrive. And given the particular economic structure, of course you get over tourism. It's just too tempting if you're trying to squeeze money out of your enterprise not to take advantage of this global system of attractions that hold people in their sway and people want to see them. You didn't make them. You don't have to maintain them. You don't have to advertise them. You don't have to do anything with them. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, season three, Invocations. This season features a deeper dive into the crevices of exile, wanderlust, and radical hospitality with diverse authors, activists, and storytellers. For some, tourism can entail learning, freedom, and financial survival. For others, it means the loss of culture, land, and lineage. Our conversations explore the unauthorized histories and consequences of modern travel. These are dispatches from the resistance. You can listen and subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any major podcast platform. You can follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. And if you want to continue to see the project grow, you can support us via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The End of Tourism. I'll be your host, Chris Christou. On this episode, my guest is Dean McCannell, a social analyst and critic whose writings on contemporary cultural arrangements have been translated worldwide. He is best known for his path-breaking book, The Tourist, A New Theory of the Leisure Class. His most recent book is 18 and Out, a memoir of his childhood and youth. In this interview, we discuss Dean's pioneering book, The Tourist, and how it rooted the entire area of critical tourism studies. We look back into mass tourism's emergence in the 1970s and 80s, what has changed in that time, how tourists' own homes have become destinations, the loss of human connections, hyperculture, the rise of anti-tourism social movements, how we can understand ourselves and the foreigner as radically other, and how that might hold the key for interculturality in our times. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, Dean. It's an honor to be able to speak to you. Real honor. I'm pleased to join you. As I've told you before, I very much enjoy the direction you've been taking with your podcast. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. And would you do us the honor of telling us where you find yourself today and maybe what the world looks like for you? Well, I'm finding myself in suburban San Francisco where we live. And the world looks really lovely at the moment because we're drying out. After, you know, what everyone else on earth would call a monsoon, Mm -hmm. we call an atmospheric river, which has drenched us and flooded us for the last several weeks. But the sun is shining brightly and the ground is drying and it's a nice moment. And we personally didn't suffer from it. We live on a hillside that isn't falling down and the water runs off it. So we're okay. We've been okay. But there's been a tremendous amount of damage done. The whole state is in a state of emergency. Well, well, may there be some mercy for all of those involved. Yes, absolutely. So it could be said that through the myriad slipstreams of life and time and consequence that this podcast, this endeavor has found its way into the world through your work. Your pioneering book, The Tourist, A New Theory of the Leisure Class, was first published, if I'm not mistaken, in 1976. That's and helped to launch the field of modern tourism studies. That's what they say. I wish I could take credit for it, but <laughs> also the way in which tourism studies unfolded is quite different from the way it would have unfolded if they really took my book seriously. So 
I would regard it as an illegitimate child, actually, Hmm. (laughs) because in all of my work, I see a tension or a split or even an opposition between the fundamental impulse, the curiosity that drives an ethical tourist and the industry that has been set up to serve that curiosity. I Hmm. see them as being in, in tension and even opposition with each other. And my focus has always been on the very human, the sort of ineluctably human quality of needing to know more about other kinds of human beings, which I see as a very positive and ethical drive on the one side. And on the other side, the way that that drive has been monetized and basically subdued and people are simply, you know, packaged up in large containers and dumped onto destinations without there being any real forethought. So what is called the tourism industry, I see as basically anti-tourism the way I defined it. Mm. And most of my colleagues, my colleagues define their role as figuring out ways to make the tourist industry more efficient. How do you market a destination more effectively? You know, how do you deal with the damage that tourists do more effectively? It's all a matter of um, attempting to rationalize and stabilize the industrial side of it. And basically, I don't see that there's anything particularly wrong with that, but it isn't about the human aspect of tourism at all. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's extremely important for all those people who see the modern or contemporary universities as too radical, right? (laughs) Hardly. The university in the United States has evolved in the last 20, 25 years into a degree mill. It's a holding pen for middle class and middle class aspiring young people to, you know, basically license them to continue in middle-class employment. And I think that the educational mission, for the most part, has gone down the drain. Mm, Strong words, but I don't think there's a, a lot of people that would necessarily disagree with you. It's a sad state of affairs when we have one of the most exploited underclasses of workers, the temporary university instructor, being paid like $3,000 a course to do, you know, in many instances, half or more of the undergraduate instruction. They never come in contact with a quote-unquote faculty member, or very rarely do. And it's a scandal which will break at some point, but as of now, they're puttering along in an an industrial model of education. Mm -hmm. And this, coming from someone who you know, I imagine more or less a lifelong academic, if I can say that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I taught at the University of California at Davis for 33 years, happily. It's a big research institution, mainly agriculture. I was happily there. I liked being around people whose theoretical work also had important applications. And so most of my colleagues were like that. They weren't you know, way up in the sky someplace, and they weren't entirely ground gripping either. It's a nice balance of theory and practice in a college of agriculture. So I was very happy hanging out there for 33 years, but I could see the changes coming from a mile off. And basically, unlike many of my colleagues who die with their boots on, I have One of my undergraduate teachers at Berkeley, Laura Nader, quite a well-known anthropologist, uh, just retired. She was my undergraduate anthropology teacher at at Berkeley, and she was well into her 90s before she retired. And I I have many of my colleagues hanging on like that. And I stopped when I turned 68. I thought this is the direction it is taking us. I can't support it. and. It's time to get out. Mm. Wow. And, you know, when you started out as a professor, the the academic scene in California, what you saw, and perhaps in regards to what might have been referred to as tourism studies back then, did you see then what you see now in regards to how academia 
as you said, creates this, this dynamic in which the work is meant to some degree or another propagate the goals of the industry. What was the, the main inspiration for you in beginning to write this book and beginning to work in critical tourism studies? Yeah, I had at the time that I wrote the tourists, basically, there wasn't any tourism industry. Mm. I think there's a comment somewhere in the tourists that the big capital must have been looking in horror at the growth of tourism. There were a couple of Disney parks and there were sort of ragtag tours in Europe where you could do, you know, five capitals in seven days on a bus. But basically, all of tourism was a matter of you booking your flights or however you were going to get there and finding your hotels and restaurants on the spot and deciding where you wanted to go and what you wanted to see. And that there were a lot of people doing that, but there were no huge tour companies. There were no enormous charter flights. There were no tourist hotels. And so my book, The Tourist, was written for a kind of tourism that existed before there was an industry. And it remains that way. Fortunately, the human impulses that drove all of tourism then still exist in the world today. And the book, you know, continues to hang around. It's never gone out of print. It's now in 10 different languages. And there were no tourism researchers at that time. I was doing field work in rural sociology in Puerto Rico. And I was studying or actually assisting a study of the adoption of new technologies by Puerto Rican farmers, okay? And while we were down there, I married Juliet Flower McCannell, which is a very important part of my life. But on our weekends, we'd go to the beach, and I noticed the first big high-rise hotel going up on a beach. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I strongly suspect that What's going to happen around this hotel is going to have a bigger impact on the people of Puerto Rico than the their farmer's choice of new technologies. So basically, as a rural sociological scientist, I made a decision at that point that I was probably studying the wrong thing. If I wanted to catch the wave of history, I better try to figure out what tourism was all about. And I assumed when I got back to Cornell that I go in the library and find hundreds of books about international tourism and travel and sightseeing. And of course, there were all these writings about people's travel experiences, but there was absolutely nothing analytical about tourism. Excuse me. So I suddenly was confronted with this conundrum, this thing I thought it was going to become important. Nobody else apparently thought that it was important enough to try to it and analyze it and get to the bottom of it. So I proposed as a PhD dissertation to write The Tourist, and my dissertation committee rejected it completely. It was a good turndown. They said it was an important topic, one, and two, they told me, you're smart enough to do it justice, but because it's never been done before, it's going to take at least 10 years for you to get it into shape. And we don't want you hanging around for that long. So just just write a quick and dirty dissertation and get out of here. Wow. And they, they were exactly correct. It took me exactly 10 years from midway through graduate school to the publication of The Tourist. And so their call was a correct one. It seemed cruel to me at the time, but it it was a correct one. And it, it came out and it created quite a stir. It was reviewed by the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Christian Science Monitor and Women's Wear Daily. And I just thought that when you wrote a book, that's what happens. <laughs> but But I've learned now that <clears throat> you can write a book and that simply doesn't happen. But at the time, it was just like being on cruise control, and very few academics picked up on it early on. It was picked up on by architects and urban planners and urban designers and artists, public artists, and 
art historians, and almost everybody but sociology and anthropology, even though I'd written it for those fields. And it took at least 10 or 12 years before the first nibbles from the social sciences came. And sociology conceded all of tourism studies to tourism studies, a field that started to pull itself together and gain momentum about that time. This would have been the 1980s. And now, of course, it's a global phenomenon with departments all over the world and dozens and dozens of academic journals and books just coming out, you know, every couple of hours. So it's way beyond my capacity to wrap my arms around it now. Mm. Well, it's incredible. I mean, for me, it's mind boggling that this book was written in the mid 70s, not only in part because As you said, tourism studies didn't really exist at the time, and it would be extremely difficult, I think, for people of my generation or younger to imagine how small it would have been relative to today. And, you know, I picked this book up some five or six years ago and started reading it. It's just strewn with notes in the margins because it's it's, it's incredible how so much of what you've written is as relevant today as it would have been in the past, if not more so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Shock and Books, my original publisher, which no longer exists, but it was started by in Germany by Ted Schocken. Um, and it was the publisher of Kafka and others. And basically, it published a great deal of Judaica. So in 1933 or 34, Ted Schocken saw the writing on the wall And he went down and bought steamship tickets for everyone who worked for him and all the members of their family that they wished to take with them. And he moved from Germany to New York City. He packed up the publishing company and put it on a ship. And they say he got off the ship in New York and walked up Fifth Avenue and rented a whole flat, a loft in a high rise, and came back to the boat and told the people where to take all of the manuscripts and everything they were carrying with them. And they, so the whole company moved and became the most respected of the commercial publishers. They reached out to me after I published my piece on staged authenticity in the American Journal of Sociology. They reached out and said, have you got any more of this? And of course, I had a great deal more of it, but they really worked well as a publisher And my editor there, as we were doing the editing, my editor, a young Scottish guy, said, this book will never go out of print. And I just laughed my head off. I just said, what? (laughs) That's ridiculous. And apparently, you know, there was some truth to it. At least it's hung on for, you know, 40 some years so far. What a thing. And what a lineage to be entered into. I'm curious, since the book's publication, I'm sure our listeners could very well imagine that tourism has grown exponentially, and that's more or less an understatement. I'm curious for you, from your perspective, what what have been the most remarkable changes in the tourism industry or the critiques of tourism in the last, let's see, we're going on almost 50 years since the book was published. Yeah. The main thing that impresses me is the growth of the industry itself and the extent to which the industry subverts the original impulse to travel. Mm. And the fact that they have promoted an idea that, first of all, everybody ought to do it, even if they have no reason to. The sad part is that they have removed the reason to travel beyond you know, travel for travel's sake. There is a phenomenon today, which is very commonplace, of somebody saying, I just want to go somewhere. They don't care where they're going to go. Mm. And the industry can dump them onto a beach on the coast of Del Sol or something. And they're just as happy as if they were taken to someplace else. And so that's been a very successful sort of repackaging of tourist desire by the industry, but it's been extremely detrimental both to the tourists themselves and to the locations that they get dumped on. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, nobody wants to have their entire life trashed by a bunch of people who don't really care whether they're there or someplace else. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, that's the the biggest sort of horrific, problematic part of what's happened as a result of a full force entry of the industry into the act of tourism. Wow, thank you for that. I'd like to, if I can, pull a little quote from The Tourist. And uh, just a reminder, again, this is 1976. But in the book, you write, from the standpoint of the tourist, the movement of the edge of the tourist world always seems to be away from him. As each destination is reached, it is in a sense assimilated, becoming less foreign than the imagination held it to be. Then the frontier of the tourist world recedes to his next destination. But tours are circular structures, and the last destination is the same as the point of origin, home. Now, given the, so much of what's come to pass in the last 50 years, I'm curious what you think tourism has done to our understandings of home given the rise in contemporary expatriation and digital nomadism? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good question and an interesting question. Tourism generates its own new kind of culture, the destinations, and also in the home. The home of most tourists is also a tourist destination now. And one of the effects of having mass tourism is that it tends to break up local cultures and turn them into a few tokens and fragments of their former selves and reassembling them into a tourist experience. And that's happening to people's homes or home places as well as to the places that they visit. And ultimately, I don't think it's a threat to the industry. I think the industry could ride this out. But in the evolution that you're describing, there is a tendency for every place on earth to increasingly resemble every other place on earth Mm. and uh, including the place that tourists are coming from once that happens it will have an effect on the tourist motivation at that point it'll probably all transfer over into what i call the seven deadly sins tourism it's Mm. the white lotus or the menu kind of tourism where basically it can happen any place on earth all you have to do is have a resort that's symbolic of luxury and convince the tourists that they are the kings of the world and that their every desire will be catered to without any consequences whatsoever and that kind of a device a white lotus type of device can be plopped down anywhere you're acquainted with this series that i'm referring to this no, oh, no, oh, I know okay. of it, but I've never seen oh, it. Oh, okay. Very, very popular. It's run for two seasons, a series about the wretched desires and motivations and behaviors of very wealthy people. And now it's a chain of resorts. The first one was set in Hawaii. The second one was set in, in Sicily. And it became very discussed here in the United States and was watched by millions of people who apparently enjoy watching very rich people make asses of themselves. But my point is different from that. My point is that here is a tourist device where you can make a lot of money from it if you own one of these things and manage it effectively. And it doesn't make any difference where it's located. You can put one anywhere and fill it up with people that are willing to spend you know, three or four thousand dollars a night. It rings a little bit of, uh, I guess, virtual reality in the sense of you don't need to leave home to experience certain things. I was just reading the other day that I think it's the CEO of the Open AI firm. Part of the idea is is a kind of techno utopia where we're going to use this artificial intelligence to ensure that nobody has to work. And it sounds it sounds beautiful, right? But of course, the trajectory culturally doesn't change, <laughs> but everything else does. It's like, okay, well, everyone can go on vacation, right? But of course, there'll still be consequences. Uh, yeah, I don't think that anybody's thought through the way in which technology has basically started taking over every area of human life. Nobody's really successfully imagined where that's going. I know mm. that Zuckerberg is trying it with Meta, thinks that everybody will be 
happier if they're running around in a semi-fictional world and your avatar can buy Prada handbags and everything will work perfectly, but it isn't the world. The consequences of a loss of human connection, the kind of vulnerabilities that we have when we're present with one another, uh, and the kinds of possibilities that exist when we're present with one another, can only exist when we're present to one another. The consequences of a wholesale loss of that have yet to be imagined. And I suspect if I were starting out now, if I were in the middle of my graduate school now, I'd be working on that problem rather than the tourism is feeding into it in an interesting way. But that's not the next wave of problematics that we're about to have. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that that very point, in part because someone had sent me in the direction of a book called Hyperculture by a South Korean philosopher named Byung Chul Han. So in this particular book, it was published in 2005 or 2006, but significant time when we consider that I remember backpacking for the first time, more or less around 2004, 2005, and there was no Wi-Fi, right? Anywhere. Right, right. yeah. But on the opening page, he poses a kind of dual question, And so I'm going to read that question. I'm going to pose it for you, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. So he writes that the British ethnologist, Nigel Barley, once expressed the suspicion that, quote, the true key to the future, unquote, was, quote, that fundamental concepts such as culture will cease to exist, end quote. We are all, Barley said, quote, more or less, tourists in Hawaiian shirts, end quote. After the end of culture, should the new human being simply be called tourist? Or are we at long last living in a culture that affords us the freedom to spread into the wide open world? Okay. (laughs) So So he's kind of getting at this notion that it, it is possible, at least in his eyes, some 15 years ago, that the culture was moving towards a kind of milieu wherein there would be nothing but a touristic way of life in the world. Yeah, it's an an interesting observation, and it clearly bespeaks a definition of culture, which is more restricted than any one that I would use. He's clearly talking about what we used to call high culture on the one side, and also we used to call like national cultures or French culture or Japanese culture or peasant culture. Yeah, peasant culture, like that. And uh, if there's anything that the recent theoretical advances that have been made, the actual ones, not the phony ones that everybody waves their arms around about, but have been made after structuralism and post-structuralism is that, yes, you can talk of culture that way, but if culture is basically the machinery of meaning and how do you move it back and forth between human beings, which Japanese culture and French culture would be an example of that, and high culture would be an example of that, But basically, you can't have any kind of transmission of anything, whether it's knowledge or information, without having a fairly precise set of cultural operations going on and interpretive frameworks existing between the interlocutors. So from the beginning, the way that I set the tourist up was within this much broader definition of culture as as the means of communication between people, whether they quote unquote share a culture or maybe they don't. They're still communicating with each other and we have to figure out how they're doing that. So I kind of like this formulation. It's got a nice, you know, sort of paradigmatic quality to it. But even in a world where we're all tourists in Hawaiian shirts, we have a culture. As long as there's human beings doing something and other people looking at them and wondering what they're up to, there's culture. So a world of tourists would be a world with a very different kind of culture, and it would have to be subject to 
you know, new ethnographic grasp, but it would be there. There would be a culture there. Well, it seems that there's been a lot of people in tourist destinations more than others, more than other places that have interpreted tourism as having rather adverse consequences on (laughs) them and the places they live in. So I want to ask you a little bit about what is kind of broadly referred to as anti-tourism in the context of this hypermobility. And it's been, according to my research anyways, about 30 years that these, quote, anti-tourism movements have sprung up in tourist destinations, typically across the world. And I wanted to ask you, what do you make of these typically disparate movements in the context of your work? I imagine that surely a lot of them have been influenced in part by what you put yourself to. Yes, the word that you're using right now, anti-tourism, is very distinct from the word anti-tourism that I was using earlier. Right. You're speaking of social mobilization to try to ameliorate the damaging, either natural or cultural damage that's done by being over-touristed, however that's defined. I mean, it mm. might be defined by having one tourist around, but this is, why, this is the wrong one. And when I said anti-tourism earlier, I was talking about um, the way in which the industry basically kills off the very human curiosity that motivated tourism in the first place. So if we can keep those two versions of it separate, yeah, absolutely. It makes perfect sense that people will be mobilizing against tourists especially if they are in industrial dumping grounds like the Costa del Sol in Spain and probably in parts of Mexico as well. (coughs) I like to say that every tourist destination gets exactly the number and exactly the type of tourist that it deserves. Mm. And that's a harsh statement, but When I say that, what I'm saying, or the way I would back that is that if you think you have too many tourists, or if you think you've got the wrong kind of tourists, if they're a bunch of drunken louts that are trashing your beach or whatever, there are very, very easily accessible means to stop that and to stop it cold and to stop it immediately. Hmm. This is not something that requires an act of Congress. All you have to do is start charging a thousand dollars a day for parking tour buses or enforcing littering laws. It's a human management problem that can be handled at the level of local policing and local ordinances. So it makes perfect sense for people to mobilize. The points of leverage are fairly obvious. And I say they should go for it. They won't stop tourism. They won't stop the kind of tourism that I wrote about in the tourist. But they probably don't want to stop that kind of tourism. Mm. And uh, so they need to understand that the industry is the culprit, not the tourists. And if they can get rid of the industrial tourists, it's very similar to the distinction that is made between industrial agriculture and sustainable organic agriculture. The parallels are completely striking. You know, industrial agriculture doesn't deliver you very good food, and industrial tourism doesn't deliver you very good tourist experiences. But if you have small-scale, sustainable, organic practices, then you can actually talk about a quality experience, a quality consumption experience. And so the two things are quite a bit in sync. But anybody who wants to stop tourism in a municipality or a region can do so very simply. The Louvre just made a policy shift to say that they're going to cut the number of visitors by one third, period. And you mentioned earlier that things must have changed a lot since I wrote The Tourist. To tell you how much they changed, we were living in Paris for a year when I was working on the book. And I would go to the Louvre several days a week and stand next to the Mona Lisa to try to observe tourists looking at the Mona Lisa. And some days I couldn't, there wasn't anybody there. (laughs) And the last couple of times I tried to get into the museum, I couldn't get in. The lines were just too long. 
Wow. And, and wow. if you've ever seen people in the room where the Mona Lisa is, you, the painting is way off in the background someplace. And all you see are the backs of hundreds of heads. And, mm. and so, yeah, that has happened. And that's part of what I mean by the industry is destroying the experience that it's selling. Right, right. Yeah, it seems limitless in that regard. But at least the Louvre and these social movements, what they're arguing for is not only limits, but degrowth, right? No, degrowth is it's very important because especially when you have places that have a huge build out of vacation homes and cheap hotels that can accommodate thousands of, of people that aren't spending very much money. And the whole region goes into a downward spiral in terms of price wars for prefix meals and that sort of thing. It needs to be not just new limits put on it, but it does need to be cut back, actually. Mm. And the other question I have regarding this type of anti-tourism or the social movements that are never really explicitly against tourism, but typically for the neighborhood, for the people. And so it's very tends to be very diverse in that way. But you spoke about Paris, right? And it's interesting to me because places like Barcelona and Venice, which are, I believe, in the top five of the most over-touristed places in the world, yeah. relative to the amount of people living there, they have very, very strong, quote-unquote, anti-tourism movements. But we have places like London and Paris, which are, I think, the top two most visited cities in the world. And you don't see any of that there. Yeah. And I'm curious, why do you think that is? Why do you think that these other cities, just as well known, not as visited as far as total visitors per year? Because I can imagine, I have friends who live in London, I have friends who live in Paris, and they go through the same struggles as anyone else living in a big city these days about gentrification, cost of living, et cetera. But they, but they, but they're not opposed to tourism. Generally not. I mean, generally not. Yeah, yeah. I believe that that's for good reason. That the both Paris and London, to some extent, it's also true of San Francisco. First of all, they got a head start in the business. They were very popular tourist destinations before there was a tourist industry. So they figured out how to accommodate having visitors in the numbers of actually in the annual visits to these favorite destinations runs something like five times their actual population size and, and more. They had developed localized systems, localized within the cities, within the regional infrastructure to accommodate high numbers before they got slammed by the industry. And so if you go to Paris today, the streets are teeming with tourists, but they're not in bunches. They're not in a wad that has gotten off of a bus and stays a wad everywhere it goes, takes over a whole restaurant, or gets pushed into a museum as a giant group that will block your view of everything you're trying to see if you come in after them. The tourists are dispersed. They're in family groupings. They're handling most stuff on their own. The cities are capable of dealing with that. So on a human scale, it's been worked out in advance. The other cities, Venice got whacked by the super scale of the new tour boats. They didn't have tour boats that would hold several thousand people three or four decades ago. You know, you had to get into... Venice overland. I don't think hardly anybody arrived by boat. And so it was kind of a sleepy little place in the 1960s. Very beautiful, obviously, but there weren't any tourists around. But now they can bring these floating cities into the harbor and dump thousands of people out. And they can run around and take pictures and despoil San Marcos Square and then go back to the ship for their meals and entertainment. They don't even have to drop any money in the town. And they're encouraged not to, or at least to the vendors who are affiliated with the cruise ship. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can get all of that taken care of here cheaper and easier. So it's an incredibly exploitative thing. 
because basically the pull, the attraction, the things that tourists are still told that they're supposed to be seeing are free goods to the industry. Mm. The industry did not have to paint the Mona Lisa. Mm. And the industry wouldn't have to paint another Mona Lisa to double the numbers of people they could dump into the Louvre. All they have to do is double the size of their tour bus or double the number of tour buses that arrive. And given particular economic structure, of course you get over tourism. It's just too tempting if you're trying to squeeze money out of your enterprise not to take advantage of this global system of attractions that hold people in their sway and people want to see them. You didn't make them. You don't have to maintain them. You don't have to advertise them. You don't have to do anything with them. They're just Mm. there and they're the motivation for your customers. And it's the best business that anybody could get into. For now, for now. Yeah. I'd like to, if we can return to the anti-tourism that you wrote of the aspect of human life and human desire that the tourist industry tends to subvert on the podcast. We talk from time to time about this kind of very loose notion of radical hospitality and how that might be conjured in the world. And so there's a little aspect or there's part of that, that I think arises in the tourist. So in the tourist, you write that whether or not tourism on a practical level can ever be a quote, utopia of difference ultimately depends on its capacity to recognize and accept otherness as radically other. To me, this means the possibility of recognizing and attempting to enter into a dialogue on an equal footing with forms of intelligence absolutely different from my own. Would you, Dean, be able to elaborate a little bit on this and what it means to understand oneself or another as, quote, radically other, and how such a perspective might be might be constituted in a time where globalization has seemed to eclipse that possibility. Yeah. As long as we're human and language is our main tool for relating to one another, that that particular formulation that you were reading will ever go away. It just Mm. has to be recognized that, you know, we never know what's going on, even in our own heads, actually, Mm. much less the head of another. All we can do is try to communicate that to one another, to pass it back and forth. And and it will never be a perfect reconstruction. You know, there's no way in the world that I could actually give you everything that's in my head and you vice versa. But we can make some really quite wonderful constructions between us to get partial access to that. And so the other remains radically other, but the human connection is in the shared interpretation of the effort to sort of bridge that gap. The gap is never going to go away, but we can try to bridge that gap. And in an ideal ethical tourist relationship or setup, you have a tourist and a local host It could be an institution, but it could be a person who are recognized their role in that relationship. They're trying to get to know each other. They're trying to understand the local person or the local institution, trying to understand how the honored guest is seeing them, want to correct any misunderstandings. And the same thing is going on the other way. So it's an argument for a a very elaborate conversation to happen between the tourist and the local. And those things happen. Juliet and I hitchhiked all over Europe and across Eastern Europe to Istanbul in 1968, going through the Iron Curtain and all the way. And we were given ride after ride after ride by very, very different kinds of people. And they love to have somebody to talk to that they weren't ever going to meet again. We were very conscious of having a role in being able for them to be to express themselves openly to a, an honored stranger who would 
automatically carry their secrets without revealing them. And so there is a very positive role available in the tourist-local relationship for all parties if they wish to develop that. And there are some forms of tourism today that where this is a manifest part of it. In Japan, there is a kind of tourism that they call contento tourism. Have you heard of this? No. 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 Okay. What happened was that the young people in Japan who love anime and manga that their favorite artists used rural village settings and actually drew like the background or the mise-en-scene of their manga cartoons were actual places that the artists had drawn. And when the kids discovered this, they went out into the countryside to try to find the locations where the manga artists had set up their easels. And they found them in remote rural towns and They were delighted when the old people in the town uh, saw, and usually these towns are dying and their young people have all moved to Osaka or Tokyo, and they see young people coming and seem to be very appreciative of what's going on in the town. The old people come out and say, well, you know, why are you here? What are you doing here? And when they're told, and they say, oh, yeah, I remember that artist guy came. He was here for a while and he did this. And... What happened naturally, without there being any kind of policy intervention, was that the young people from the city and the old people in the villages began to create festivals to honor the manga scene. Mm -hmm. And then the young people would make pilgrimages to these villages that had been the backdrop. And they would get together by local village elders and young fans of the comic. And now... The government of Japan has realized that this was a naturally occurring rural development initiative that they didn't have anything to do with, but it was having a profound economic effect. And so they've actually put in support for it. And now if you've had a manga comic drawn in your town, the government will commission a famous artist to create bronze sculptures of the manga characters to set up in the village to be permanent attractions for the continuous pilgrimages that are made by the students or young people. And so it's an emergent new formation, which has all of the trappings of what I would call an ethical, sustainable tourist relationship between Mm. the tourist and the local. And the respect is running both directions and it works on every level. So it doesn't have to be the industry model. This happened totally outside of any tourist industrial interventions. Now, they'll probably want to take parts of it over, of course. That's what happens. Then it has to break out in a new place. Wow. Well, you've spoken to us very generously and graciously in part about some of your travels. And just recently in December, you released a new book, this one, Not specifically devoted to tourism and not necessarily in the context of the academia, but a memoir entitled 18 and Out, in which, quote, you expose some of the seamier aspects of the greatest generation and the depth of fissures in American society that are often miscast as recent. Here, too, are the radically different influences in your upbringing and early education that led you to your distinctive approach to modern social relations. I'd love to ask you what it was like writing this book for you, finally reflecting on the world in the context of your own life. It was an interesting exercise. I must say I wrote it during COVID when a lot of our other responsibilities, especially travel responsibilities, backed off. So I had the time to write it. I had a very unusual childhood and youth in which I was repeatedly told by my parents that I was too stupid to go to college so that there would be no investment in that direction on their part. Mm -hmm. And that when I turned 18, I was to leave the house, hence the title of the book. And so the book is about me preparing myself for an honorable blue collar life career. And at age 15, I was actually hired as a night mechanic for a large motor pool continued to go to high school, but worked in the nights to 
support myself. I was able to move away from home at age 16. And by the time I was 17, I was apprenticed to a racing mechanic. We had a shop and a racing program of our own, automobile racing. And I was very happy and content and assuming that this would be my life and that it would be a good life until about two weeks before the first day of class of my freshman year when I changed directions completely and went to college. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I think that the lesson of 18 and out is that, that the preparation that I was making to be a blue collar worker for the rest of my life figured very heavily in the way that I handled my research and writing and scholarship later on. Very different approach, I believe, to a kid that took the usual route of studying hard and assuming they'd go off to college and trying to figure out their major and going on to whatever career that would take them into. I always thought of writing as a form of handwork and the job is a job to <clears throat> get done and, and then turn my attention to the next job. So I have had a very different kind of outlook on the day-to-day than most of my academic colleagues. Well, and in reflecting, having this time to reflect, not just through the pandemic, but in writing this memoir, what advice would have, if any, for people, either of your generation or younger people, trying to contend with the dilemmas of our time in regards to tourism or otherwise? The advice that I have given all of my graduate students over the years is pay very close attention to your plan B, because that's probably where you're going to end up. Mm. Everybody has the same plan A. If they're in graduate school, they want to get a position in a research university and publish 15 articles and get tenure. And that has never interested me very much at all. And I think it's a kind of of a stupid framework, actually, for any kind of career. But I tell them, what would you do if that didn't happen? Let's suppose that's taken off the table. And I love it when I find people that have figured out really interesting and exciting plan B. And I collect those Mm -hmm. as examples. Mm. Amazing. Well, you know, I imagine as well that some of our guests are discovering you and your work for the first time here on the pod. How might they be able to find your work, your books, and the new 18 and Out? They're all on the web. You can order 18 and Out in normal ways. It's featured fairly prominently on Amazon. I do not have a Facebook page. I do not do Twitter. All I do is email, and I'm a very good email correspondent. And even though I don't have any of that stuff going on, there's a a pretty horrendous web presence of my work, and it's accessible. The articles and chapters are downloadable from academia.edu or Google Scholar, those standardized places where you can pick up almost not everything I've written, but most of the stuff. The books are all still available. Well, I'll make sure that... that links for your scholarly work, your papers, and your books, The Tourist, The Ethics of Sightseeing, 18 and Out, and the others are all available on the End of Tourism website when the episode launches. That's terrific. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Dean. It's been a great honor and a great pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Anytime. Things evolve. Thanks for listening, everyone. For more, you can check out the homework section under each episode on our website at theendoftourism.com. We'd also like to offer a deep bow of gratitude for our patrons who ensure that the project keeps growing and so that all of you can listen without a paywall. In this way, we participate in the gift economy and invite you to do the same via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash theendoftourism. Likewise, you can follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. Until next time, farewell friends.